Hi there, everyone. Good afternoon from the UK. Um, good morning or good evening, wherever you are. Um, thank you for joining us on um, the next day of our Prospectus 2021 conference. Um, hope you've been enjoying it so far. We've had some great sessions. Um, today promises to be particularly interesting. We have a wide ranging keynote from good friend and uh, industry specialist, Tom Johansmeyer, the head of PCS at Verisk Insurance Solutions. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, Steve. Always a pleasure. So it's good to have Tom here again, and some people may have seen his keynote speech earlier this year at our Asia conference, which had a much more of an ILS focus. But today, Tom's going to talk us through some of the key risks facing the reinsurance industry at this time. And these are risks that just aren't going to go away and um, things that people really need to be thinking about at this point in time with renewals approaching and with 2021 looming as well. Um, so I'm going to hand this straight over to Tom. He's got some slides to go through. We're going to have some Q&A at the end. You can submit questions as we go as well. Um, and we'll see how long we can keep Tom on the hook for with some good questions from the audience. Um, so Tom, over to you. Outstanding. Thank you, Steve. And hey, everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, I know that this is conference season right now, and you're seeing a lot of the same stuff over and over again. Uh, I can comfortably promise you something much different. As you can see, we're talking about the Four Horsemen of 2021. That title is no joke. All right, these are the four big problems you've got to think about heading into 1-1 and through next year. Uh, Steve and I were talking a little bit right before we got started, as you do with these things, and I mentioned that there's going to be some difficult messaging in here for underwriters and portfolio managers to face. Uh, I'm doing that on purpose. You know, you think about our industry looks at issues like catastrophe, for example, you know, heading into 2016. We looked at CAT the way we always did, and we didn't worry about other issues that could subtly increase the loss experience. What happens after that? Hurricane Irma. Now anybody can talk about in Florida is AOB and social inflation. I don't know if the issues we're going to talk about today are going to be as bad as AOB in Florida. Let's hope not, right? But these are the things that really should be on your mind rather than defaulting to your historical view of CAT and hoping these issues don't catch you for a while. Okay. Well, let's jump, jump right in here. First off, 2020 started out before COVID. This was going to be a tough year. And most of that began several years ago, right? So right before 2020 started, we had the uh, hailstorms in Australia with a record number of auto claims in any 24-hour period. We had a massive wildfire season in Australia, the likes of which the country hadn't seen. Um, I had my team dispatch a lot of materials out to the local Australian market from U.S. wildfire, figuring, you know what, it's not local market stuff, but at least this is real information on how insurance industries handle wildfire. And I'm, I'm told those materials helped a lot uh, when the insurance industry was trying to wrap their head around that event. 2019 storms, Faxi and Hagibis, let's not forget Jebby, Trammy, Michael, Irma are still developing uh, with various, varying degrees of significance. What's this mean? Coming into 2020, we had three years of loss development that we were still sifting through. That's not trivial, right? You know, throw on top of that, last year's Chilean riots, 12 years ago, the largest riot in civil disorder on record in PCS history, and that includes this year's George Floyd riots. You know, we've got trapped collateral, particularly on ADNOC, which um, we found there's, there is a settled number out there being finalized. But before that came, especially at the beginning of the year, the loss range was 900 mil to 3 billion, depending on who you asked and what their sense of self-interest was. We can go on. Philly Energy Solutions has been ping-ponging between a 600 million industry loss estimate and a limits loss of 1.1. We've got a lot of M&E events over 100 mil. And then, of course, uh, you had 2019 cyber events that, again, we're pushing into 2020. And then it got worse. Okay, so... In addition to sifting through the prior year losses that we're still developing through this year, 
2020 became a, a loss experience entirely unto itself. We designated three cyber loss events and have one more under investigation, some of them big, right? Ransomware, even for SME losses, became a profound problem across the industry. And uninsured losses from cyber, while not hitting our industry's balance sheets, still hit our models. And they change how we look at the risk. And they change how we deploy to cyber, how we think about what we're going to do with our capital, right? Just because you don't take a loss doesn't mean you're not thinking about that loss and what it could mean for your portfolio. Thankfully, Beirut and Mauritius seem to be smaller than anticipated. Uh, Beirut on the marine front specifically, we don't take a view of uh, the onshore stuff. Um, onshore losses, uh, large risk losses on the other hand, were rather significant. You've got Latte uh, over 500. You've got Hammerfest, which could be around 500, maybe even a little more. And then we've got three risk losses on the books right now from the George Floyd riots, three retailers, and potentially more to come. And speaking of the George Floyd riots, up until 2020, PCS had 12 SRCC events in the U.S. going back to 1965. None before that. Uh, we go back to 1950, right? But... Of those 12, none had more than one state as part of the cat. George Floyd riots this year, the first PCS riot civil disorder cat event to have more than one state on it. It had more than 20. And with more than $2 billion in insured losses, we're still seeing that loss develop. <laughs> Okay, and now let's get to the one thing everybody worries about in the Artemis and reinsurance news community at this time of year, natural catastrophe. So for the second year in a row, we have a record number of cats in the U.S. We're already up, oh, it says over 60. We're already comfortably over 65 by now. Um, and it was the third most active annual total for insured cat losses so far. And keep in mind, we had one come out yesterday which isn't reflected in that total on this deck. We have um, more resurveys going on, and we still have ADA out there as well. So, and also in December, it's not unusual to see some big Tor Hale events out in Texas, Oklahoma, or the Midwest. So year's not over yet. It could get more difficult. 10 tropical storm events, uh, again, not including IOTA, if it makes its way up here. Uh, I mean, we have eight convectives over a billion, nine events over two billion, including the riots, right? Canada, more than 12 events, second most active on record for us. Again, so far, years not over. We saw one in Japan. We saw our first um, new catastrophe event in Mexico since launching PCS Mexico. We saw our fourth PCS designated cat in Turkey, uh, the Izmir earthquake which is uh, the first we've done since 2017. This has not been a quiet year. There was no big, you know, 10 or $20 billion cat like in 2017, but still, A, these are big numbers. A lot of them hitting 3 billion franchise, uh, hitting the 3 billion franchise, right? And then on top of that, they could still develop. So even for the cats that have happened, the year's not over yet. Now let's wrap all of that in the pandemic that we've been enduring, let's say the end of February, right? I mean, it's been um, around since I, I believe January 21st is the date I see referenced most of the time, but it didn't become really a part of our lives until late February when everyone was taking a really close look at it, early May when travel started to become restricted. And then of course the office closures came not long after that. Um, What's interesting is we're coming on to a second wave right now, and it's it feels much different from the first one. There are a lot of reasons for that. We'll talk about them in a little bit. But keep in mind that as of late April, right, when we were all, you know, locked down, beaten down, exhausted, worried, you know, not sure what ICU um, beds were going to be available, the world had 2.8 million cases at that point, with uh, almost 190,000 fatalities. Now we're at over 53 million cases, that is cumulative, and 1.3 million fatalities, also cumulative. 
But when you look at just the delta between, you know, the worst of it, so to speak, in late April, at least in terms of intensity and public consciousness, right? And well, actually, let's be real. It's the worst of it based on uh, the U.S. and Western Europe's experience with um, severe lockdowns, right? Let's, let's take a, a really narrow view of how we perceive that. But 868,000 cases in the U.S. in late April. Now, by now, we're probably over 11 million because the slide's um, probably a week old. You know, Spain, which was one of the worst countries uh, affected early on, 213,000 cases by late April, now over a million and a half. And keep in mind, these numbers are still going. And then at the bottom, just to show the dynamic nature of the spread of the pandemic, India, Brazil, and Russia weren't really significant um, case um, countries for transmission in late April, and now they're among the worst affected in the world. And of course, what you can say right now is that with the resurgence we're seeing in the U.S., in Western Europe, it's almost like the, the clock is being reset. And it's being reset in November, which for the re is the riskiest and most troublesome and most frustrating time for that to happen. There are plenty of issues that remain to be resolved regarding the renewal in general of the capital availability, trapped capital, how you allocate to different classes of business, what COVID could mean for certain classes of business, even can. Um, and then let's think about the asset side where you've got, you know, asset volatility can affect available capital presidential transition, you know, you thought the election would give us some certainty and solve some problems. We're not there yet. Transition's an issue. And I can tell you, even the first 30, 60 days of a new administration, there's still going to be a lot of uncertainty that's going to affect your thinking. We've got now four years of catastrophe losses under our belt as well, and an evolving cyber environment. So if you're heading into 1-1 the way you always do, it's a problem. If you're heading into 1-1 in a way that makes you feel comfortable, I would say you probably want to step out. If you're not a little bit concerned about what's going on around you, then you're missing something big. Sorry to be blunt. You know what? After a year like this, we're all exhausted. Those of you who know me know I didn't have much tact on hand before, and what little I had then is now pretty comfortably gone. So seriously, one thing we can all agree on, no hindsight in 2020 jokes at the end of the year, please. No 1 1 renewal reports to talk about hindsight being 2020. No articles with that headline. Please, guys, we don't need it. Nobody needs this, all right? Let's just all agree on this one thing. Okay. Here's the meat of it, right? The four horsemen of 2021. What sort of pestilence and plague can you expect through the end of the year and then the entirety of the next one? Um, again, we're just going to go raw here, guys, because it's going to be a tough year. Even if we do see the vaccine that everybody's talking about come by the end of the year, it's got to, there's further validation that will be required. Distribution is not going to be easy. Manufacturing could be an issue, and keep in mind, manufacturing may have to come within the context of social distancing requirements. So COVID-19 is not going away anytime soon. Uh, Doc Fauci in the U.S. is saying Q2, Q3. Um, the natural pessimist in me says, okay, if he's saying Q2, Q3, I'm thinking maybe early Q4, things start to look a little bit better. But that's almost a year from now. Let's talk about right now. Right, We've, we're in the middle of a second wave, rapid expansion, broad infection, and the next six to eight weeks are gonna tell us a lot. Now let's focus on the US for a second, not just because I'm an American, but because it's big, it's got a track record of having handled the pandemic questionably at best. We're heading into Thanksgiving, which is a US holiday, one where there's a lot of congregation, which kicks off the holiday retail season, which leads right into Christmas. That's the next six weeks. Throw in New Year's Eve, wrap all of this around a presidential administration transition. Um, you've got a lot of risk of transmission, especially with a lot of the US being in colder climates. Um, 
COVID-19 will be problematic. You can port that thinking to most of um, Western and Central Europe and the UK as well, um, remove the US political issue, although that'll be has worldwide ramifications, but local political issues can substitute for that and bring in a sufficient amount of additional risk as well. COVID-19 is going to be a problem. SRCC, you know, the George Floyd riots were the largest SRCC event on record in the US for PCS. We all know that the underlying risk conditions haven't gone anywhere though. We've seen a lot of unrest in the US since the middle of June we just haven't seen the insured losses from it. And there are a number of reasons for that. We'll get into it in a little bit, but keep in mind, the magnificent mile rides in Chicago, you had the um, autonomous zone in Seattle, you had uh, Portland, Oregon, 90 odd or 100 days of consecutive rioting or demonstration and rioting. Philly right before the elections, DC right after the elections. And of course, nothing but political, governmental and institutional uncertainty during that period. What's that all mean? SRCC isn't going away. Even with the election in the US being done and a new president-elect having been uh, determined, SRCC risk hasn't fully abated yet and won't for a while. Cyber, the third horseman, right? Ransomware and ransomware stroke breach combos defined 2020 for this risk. I mean, there were a lot of big ransoms demanded. There were a lot of big ransoms paid and the, the concept of just paying the ransom uh, as a strategy for dealing with ransomware pretty much tripped itself up in 2020. And then, of course, you've got natural catastrophes, the fourth horseman, which we all know that one, right? Um, we've seen three major years in peak peril markets around the world. If that's not enough to have you paying close attention, I, I don't know what would be, right? So I, I did leave economic strain out of this discussion um, as a horseman, if you will, um, because it's all of them, right? So that's the result of each of those different conditions. Um, are there some economic issues that would be separate and apart from those four risks? Yes, uh, but realistically, I think if you take those four head on, you'll get a sense of the economic uh, impacts kind of, you know, in key markets and worldwide. Okay, so let's dig into a little more of a detailed look, right? And we'll start with COVID-19 because it's the big one. It's defined the year in a year where any of the other risks could have defined the year, which is the sobering thought. Um, Primary outstanding issue is uh, non-physical damage, business interruption, and how that will impact the market. Uh, it's generally seen more as a European and rest of the world issue rather than U.S., although I would caution that for large risk programs, uh, so those $100, $200, $500 million and up towers, it's going to be a while before we really get a sense of what the COVID-19 related property program losses in that sector could be sophisticated claimants, long process, lots of experts involved, uh, very lengthy and uh, expert-driven and intensive claim life cycle. So keep that in mind. Um, asset side implications remain an issue as well. I remember this came up in late April, early May. There was a flurry of retro buying because market volatility had resulted in some expected at least as a side impairment, which had capital implications. This could be an issue as well. Markets have been volatile, but the declines, of course, when they've occurred have largely not, they, they've been surprising by not having been severe, which makes you wonder if there's another shoe to drop someplace. Uh, broader economic impairment um, could hit revenue streams as well. This is something you don't hear often enough. You know, you've got all these major retailers like J. Crew or Brooks Brothers or Bed Bath and Beyond that are all either suffering in bankruptcy, possibly going into bankruptcy, acquired by private equity uh, for strategic change or restructuring. Now, these were big insurance buyers, and there's a revenue component to the insurance industry that may suffer as a result of business closures during COVID-19. You know, we always think about you know the, the claims first, right, the loss side. 
And then we think, okay, yep, and then there's the asset side that we have to deal with because that determines how much capital we got to work with, right? Yeah, okay. Um, but, you know, guys, there's a revenue bid in here as well. If people aren't buying insurance, that's less revenue coming into the market. Got to keep that in mind, right? It may not be as big or as concentrated or as forceful, but over the next couple of years, it could be noticeable. You know, you could see key accounts that draw down their insurance spend, key accounts disappear be ready for that. I mean, it, it's probably not going to be catastrophic, but it's important. Operational risk. This is one to keep in mind as well. I mean, you're going to have, you know, we're seeing now people are going back to working from home, even if they've made it into the office for a stretch. There may be more of that. Uh, there's exhaustion from working from home. You've got child care issues. You've got, you know, spouses and partners trying to figure out how to divide the house so they can both work separately without being disturbed. And then also, as people get ill, you have reductions in staff available. So, you know, a, a small team that's hit extra hard could wind up being down 25, 30 percent of their workforce. And I'll tell you about PCS right now. We keep everybody apart. Our guys haven't seen each other face to face since March because we can't afford to lose a single body. And the good news is we're geographically distributed as well. I'm down here in Bermuda. Ted's in Texas. Alex and um, Anna are in different parts of Jersey City. Um, got two guys on Long Island, not near each other. One more in Jersey, and we just hired a dude out in the West Coast. Um, and we got a dude in Florida as well. So we're exposed to different patterns of transmission as well, based on where we are in the country. We're not near each other. We're all taking specific precautions, and we've never been down more than one body due to COVID-19. Uh, this is important to keep in mind, right? If you lose a certain amount of bodies, your ability to operate is impaired. Now, I know everybody's big question is always, where are the losses coming from? Uh, over the summer, I read a good number on Artemis, um, about kind of 50 to 70 billion insured projected across lines from COVID-19 at the time. Um, I like that number based on when it came out. I would not say it's reflective of any losses from resurgence that we're seeing now. My interpretation, my gut. Um, but as we, what we did on the PCS team is back into the number, back into the breakdown, right? So let's say, okay, we, we believe 70 billion is realistic. It sounds right. But let's take a look at it and see if we can figure that out. And, you know, we've got event cancellation contingency at 15%. We've got uh, property and large risk losses in at about the same number. We know there's a couple of million, a couple of billion from Marine, a couple of billion from programs business. Um, we've got, yeah, some clean leakage into CAT, okay, SRCC, a couple of billion. Uh, and then we figure the remainder is probably work comp, DO, GL, other casualty. Uh, again, this is not science, right? This is the PCS team trying to back into what we think is realistic. As you know, we don't report all of those lines. That being said, we figure that, okay, based on the summer, 70 billion sounds realistic, and we think this is kind of what it would look like. Um, and yet it'd be kind of leave ha almost half of it as less than a well-formed guess. Yep. You know, I mean, I've got no excuse for you there. Um, but, you know, operating the way we did in order to bring some amount of clarity to where we stand as an industry, we found this to be a useful exercise. Okay, so large risk loss considerations for COVID-19. Again, you know, large sophisticated claimants can tend to find a way to justify PD. That's probably the most important industry-wide lesson that came out of the not pet you cyber attack with roughly $3 billion of property claims coming out of it. A lot of companies notify, you know, look at claim leakage as well. And I think claim leakage from cat into cat from COVID-19 or vice versa in conjunction with uh, claim leakage related to political risk factors or claim inflation related to political risk factors could become the, one of the more important enduring lessons from uh, COVID-19 and the social unrest and geopolitical volatility we're seeing right now. 
okay, implications for the reinsurance market, right? This is why you guys are showing up. You know, I, I pay the sponsor fee to get the logo up there, but this slide is what you guys really want out of me. So here we go. Capital availability, I think, is going to be the big issue, right? You know, we're, we're trying to figure out the loss situation, and there's a lot of uncertainty. There are issues with trap collateral, but at the end of the day, we're still early days on figuring out where the insured losses across classes of business from COVID-19 are going to come from. But you don't need to know that to know that there is trapped collateral. There is um, volatility in financial markets. There are risk issues that may consume capital, even if that capital hasn't been truly consumed yet, right? put it aside, preserve it, dry powder, um, estimated future impact, blah, blah, blah. These are all important. And uncertainty about longer tail classes of business could be a really big yeah. deal. That's literally the half of the pie chart I showed you on the slide over here, right? If you've got this much that is basically, oh, we figure it's a bunch of longer tail casualty stuff, that's enough uncertainty for you to keep in mind in the capital availability context, right? Um, there could also be a tendency to keep some dry powder on hand you know, as you effectively limit the amount of capital you're making available to yourself now so that you can deploy it post-renewal or you know, in that opportunistically in that intervening period between 1.1 and 1.4. Um, nonetheless, it's capital off the table for 1.1. Okay, there are, is some issues I've heard about uh, reevaluation of books and portfolios. Um, you may, you know, some underwriters are starting to think about programs they really need to be on versus want to be on versus have been on because they needed to deploy but didn't really like it. There might be some opportunities now to scale some of that back. How you generate returns may different relative to the maybe different relative to the amount of capital you're deploying. Uh, that'll depend on the rate environment, of course. Um, and you could have some issues around choosing what makes sense. You know, some classes of business that looks good before may not now. Some classes of business that you've desperately wanted to leave until now, but for reasons of momentum or other forms of commitment you haven't, this may be the opportunity. We do expect a fair amount of refocusing onto core LOBs, uh, which is always frustrating for me. Um, you know, we were making great progress with the cyber market in 2017 until that trio of hurricanes hit. You know, the refocus on the core is probably the, the biggest impediment to adoption of innovation out there right now, but it's the nature of the beast, right? You've got to focus on what makes you, what pays the bills and what fuels your ability to innovate later. Uh, you've got to focus on where the losses are as well, especially as you're paying claims. So we do see a certain amount of refocus on core LOBs coming at 1-1. It just makes sense. Okay, so moving from COVID-19 into SRCC. That's not a mistake. This is a 2019 map of the world. And if you look at it quickly, absent that big red arrow designed to draw your attention, you look at where the big dots are, like Hong Kong, Kazakhstan, Bolivia, um, Benin, you know, Montenegro, I saw a little in the UK. So basically, if you look at this map in 2019, the one thing that doesn't really matter to you is the United States. It was quiet. You know, if you were looking at this map in the early weeks of 2020, as I did, or not this map specifically, but I looked at the SRCC and civil unrest situation in the world, and I thought, okay, Chile just had a massive uh, riot that affected, you know, there were also riots in Bolivia and Colombia. And, you know, you looked at Latin America and thought, okay, Latin America is going to be a problem. Underlying situation has not eased. We see the potential for further riot civil disorder in 2020. And in the early days of COVID, we're looking at Latin America further is thinking, you've got high rates of informal workforce. So these are the folks who may not have government protection or may not direct, directly benefit from government stimulus or relief programs. Yeah, and tensions were already on edge. Latin America is going to be a problem with COVID. And then by the end of May, it was the US that experienced it. And it was 
The scale would be surprising because we've never seen anything like that. Again, from an insurance perspective specifically, um, we take a clinical view of these things. Um, yeah, the, the U.S. was not, it was always a risk because you had a polarized society. You have uh, a lot of people who have paychecks at risk or aren't going to get them at all. I remember telling a lot of clients down here in late March and early April, watch SRCC. If you have people who aren't getting paid or worried about getting evicted, uh, these are the conditions that make riot more likely. After that, what you need is that stimulating factor, that trigger that actually causes a riot to break out. And it did. So this is the map of what got affected by the George Floyd riots in late April and late May, early June. And you can see more than 20 states started in Minneapolis, which was um, probably the worst hit state, according to our estimates. Uh, but a lot of major cities affected here. And a lot of those cities continued to encounter challenges um, regarding civil unrest throughout the year. You know, Seattle and Portland in particular, right? Um, Philly had riots the week before the election, D.C. the week after. Um, there have been on and off protests in Brooklyn. And Georgia we'll talk about in a little bit. There's a, a much more complex risk situation there that requires a certain amount of focus and attention. Um, but just to give you a sense of scale, these are not just not just literally almost half the country, um, but these are generally the most populous and economically productive states in the country as well. So the headlines are always important, right? That's how we learn about these things. But let's dig a little deeper. You know, it was more than just the George Floyd riots. So Magnificent Mile was an interesting one. So it's a, a street in Chicago, right, with a lot of high-end retail. There's a, uh, 200 businesses were affected, a large number of arrests. But the construction factors were a, a big reason why the industry laws didn't become high enough for a riot designation to be warranted by PCS. So when you look at big box retailers like Target or Walmart, um, or even kind of outer edge of urban and into suburban uh, retail structures, you have standalone box stores, strip malls, and I know strip malls sound like a pejorative, but you have you do have high-end strip malls, if you will. I lived next to one when I was in Omaha for a year with high-end retailers. It was a really nice place. Um, and it was within city limits. So in these smaller cities, you can have the suburban style construction inside them. And what we learned through the riots over the summer is that what drives up industry loss from riots is fire. Fire damage causes, you know, it's damage to the structure, it uh, impairs use of the structure, it you know makes you have to shut down and rebuild. It's more costly. The BI becomes more significant. Without significant fire damage, you're looking at what smashed windows, maybe some graffiti, interior damage, uh, and door. Easier to bounce back from that. So what that means is a remediation uh, for PD is not as bad, but also you're not uh, closed for as long, so the BI impact isn't as bad either. Um, in Portland, which dominated the headlines over the summer, um, there wasn't much insured loss because it was mostly around uh, government buildings that weren't insured. So you can have a lot of unrest. You can have major social problems that are being protested or demonstrated. But if it's not occurring in a commercial area where there's a high rate of insurance penetration causing the right type of damage, then it's not going to be an insurance industry issue. And further to that, most riots in uh, PCS, on record of PCS, have been highly localized. In order to have that localized riot spread to other areas, you've got to have a, a wave of underlying conditions across the country where one can relate directly and have similar underlying circumstances that are waiting for that ex external stimulus to turn it to riot. Um, of course, it's not just the U.S., and especially heading into 2021. Um, you've got um, presumed terror, alleged terror in France, um, 
riot risk has been noted. Italy, Germany, and Spain. There was Thailand, Nigeria, I believe Singapore. Um, COVID-19 related protests across Latin America could again turn into a riot. Uh, there are a lot of issues here that could become conditions for rioting in major, major cities and countries around the world. Um, when you think about cities and metropolitan areas that have high immigrant populations and local tension regarding that, you know, be it you know Southern France, Paris, um, it's a London, Berlin, um, you've got to be aware that SRCC risk just becomes a, even a little bit higher as a result of that. Okay, but rather than look at the broad, the big picture now, let's narrow it down to a very narrow case that could be really instructive. So Georgia, Georgia's had a really interesting year, right? So it's highly susceptible to natural catastrophes, and there have been several, um, including uh, Zeta went out yesterday, or Zeta Bulletin included Florida, uh, included Georgia as well. So gets hit by natural catastrophes. You've got Atlanta, which is the ninth largest metropolitan area in the United States, 36th largest city in the United States. Um, so Atlanta's a high-profile city, you know, home to CNN, major sports teams. Uh, there's a lot happening there. It's a lot larger than its number 36 by population. Top 10 metro in the U.S. tells you a lot. The country watches Atlanta. So what happened in Atlanta this year, aside from several catastrophes? Well, it became one of the narrowest states in the presidential election. Um, watched closely, 14,000 vote count difference between the candidates. Both candidates drew a large number of votes as well. So it's a closely divided, highly polarized population with big differences between urban and outer ring of urban suburban voters and citizens versus outer suburbs and ex and exurbs the cities are a lot different from the large spaces in between the cities in georgia as i remember from my time there uh when i was stationed in augusta back when i was in the army um so close election that i don't think anybody expected to be as close as it was uh you've got two Senate runoffs now because there was no clear winner in each U.S. Senate race, those two races could define control of that House of Congress. So again, really narrow numbers, massive implications. Type for president, type for Senate, natural catastrophes, high profile city, and then throw on top of that uh, a history of contention between the mayor of Atlanta and the governor of Georgia regarding virus mitigation issues and mask wearing. At one point, uh, the governor even sued the mayor to overturn virus mitigation measures. Gives you a sense of the political climate in this catastrophe-prone state that looks like it's being surrounded by COVID-19 as well. So you look at the map, which came from the CDC, you've got okay, 15 cases per 100,000 in Georgia, not great, right? That's problematic. It's obviously not nearly the worst in the country, where in, in North Dakota, last I saw, you had 175 cases per 100,000 pop. But Georgia's a bigger state. It's a higher profile state. You've got some real cities in there, Savannah, Augusta, and of course, Atlanta. Uh, but what's tough is you look at what's happening around Georgia right now. Yeah. You know, Every one of those states has at least a 50% higher rate of COVID-19 cases per 100,000 population. You know, unless Georgia is and continues to do something really serious and significant and profound for virus mitigation, it's not going to be a different color much longer. And when you look at the ring outside of the ring around Georgia, right? So touching Georgia, you've got... South Carolina, Alabama, Florida, all had kind of the 20s. Um, or in Alabama, a little over at 31.7. Right above Georgia, though, you've got Tennessee, which has almost 50 cases per 100,000. Kentucky above that high rate. You've got um, Arkansas above Louisiana. I mean, and then once you get above the Arkansas, Tennessee, um, Kentucky rank, the blue becomes even darker. Um, so you can almost see, and if you look at the national map, it's even more evident, the wave of 
COVID-19 coming down toward uh, the co or out toward the coast, including down toward the southeast. So over the next six to eight weeks, which could be crucial for COVID-19 management, risk management, as we talked about at the beginning of the presentation, six to eight weeks could profoundly change the colors on this map while there's a presidential transition, while Georgia has two runoff elections as well, and while there's probably still some post-cat remediation and construction going on. Um, that could become an SRCC flashpoint. Let's not forget, Georgia was noted in CAT 2033. And a high-profile city, ninth largest metro in the country, again, I'm going to hammer that home, if there's a major riot there, that's the sort of situation that could spread by psychographic and demographic contiguity to cities like L.A., New York, Chicago, Detroit, D.C., Baltimore. That's the sort of situation you have to think about when it comes to localized risk factors becoming a national SRCC camp. Okay, so now let's move to cyber because we're not grim enough right now, right? Okay, 2020 has been a tough one because you've heard a lot of people saying that, you know, from the beginning of the year, and I was one of them, cyber risk will increase because you've got you know, work from home, you've got arch tech architecture changes as a result of work from home, you've got uh, social unrest, you've got general chaos from a pandemic and bad actors like that kind of thing. But that's not the only reason cyber risks increased. I think the pay the ransom dynamic contributed to it as well. You know, you had in 2018-19 early on, ransoms were five-digit numbers, give me 10, 20, $50,000 or Bitcoin equivalent um, to unlock your system. This year, we've heard of several ransom demands that went over 50 million each. They were negotiated downward, but still there were several 10 million and up ransoms that were paid. Not all of them um, were to companies that were insured, were insured sufficiently for it to hit our radar. But just keep that in mind. That's that, that was kind of economics happening, right? Take COVID out of the equation. You tell the bad guys that if you do bad things, we'll pay you. That becomes a job, <laughs> you know? They're now being compensated for their efforts. And, you know, when demand for relief from their work goes up, they get to charge more and people are paying it. Uh, U.S. Treasury Department snapped the brakes on that a bit. There are always going to be some questions around how that's executed. Maybe that'll help manage downward the ransomware issues remains to be seen. Nonetheless, we had, you know, three major losses designated. One more were investigating. Several other big ones were not insured, were not insured sufficiently. Um, cyber has been a tough year. Um, you can ascribe some of it to COVID-19. But some of it is just the natural trajectory of the cyber threat environment and the cyber insurance market. The cyber insurance market, we figure original insurance premiums five bill worldwide with reinsurance premium 2.3 to 2.5. Let's take a closer look at what that means, right? So what we're seeing is that cyber insurance is largely dominated by big buyers, right? If you're buying more than $100 million in protection, that really comes down. That's half the market, maybe a little more. Um, a lot of premium wrapped up in that. Now, that means that the smaller side is probably less insured than you might think. And what's really interesting, though, is you know, half that premium gets shipped off to re, uh, presumably more than half the risk. So you have an environment where it's really hard for cyber to grow because you're dependent, over-dependent on reinsurance capacity. Now, what you do is you throw into that um, a riskier environment due to the ransomware threat, change the dynamic by U.S. Treasury Department's constraints on paying the ransom. You've got a lot of uninsured risks out there, which again, may not hit your book, but they are gonna hit your model. They're gonna look at your underwriter, you know, your underwriter's gonna look at those. Now you're gonna think, okay, what am I going to do with this here? This is a tougher environment to underwrite than I thought. This could affect my capital allocation decisions, particularly in such an unusual, volatile, difficult year with all the other horsemen, so to speak, coming to bear. 
Okay, moving from Cyber to Matt Cat, which I know everybody's been waiting for. It's why I made it last. This gets really interesting when you look at the, the loss environment this way. So pandemic, Matt Cat, political risk. We talked about that in Georgia. Let's look at it on the map here, right? Because it's more than just Georgia. You've got you know, issues around whether an administration in a highly polarized environment will manage how it deploys aid to different states. And when you look at the map, you've got Democratic states were largely hit by wildfires. Republican states were largely hit by Gulf hurricane. And Democrat-leaning states were largely affected by East Coast hurricane. You know, it makes you wonder how the deployment of aid um, post cat might be affected by who's in power. And it, it's not just the White House, of course. You've got how Congress leans as well, and a potentially divided Congress based on the outcome of those two Senate races in Florida. So what this means for us as the insurance industry is less to do with political issues or even social issues around justice and so forth. It's more about you know, thinking, you know, where does the aid go? And how does that affect post-cat remediation? To oversimplify, if you've got a hurricane that takes the roof off a house, you've got to get the roof back on the house. Otherwise, you risk further damage from other storms, from the elements in general, from demand surge, and so on. So if you know government relief in various forms doesn't make it to that cat-affected area, it could take longer to uh, remedy those claims, which could lead to a higher cost per claim. Generally speaking, with property cap, the longer the life cycle, the more expensive the claim becomes. That turns into real losses for the insurance and reinsurance industry. Okay, could COVID-19 political risk intensify that cat? Yeah, we believe so. Um, you, you look back at the map, what's really interesting here is those cat-affected states right now aren't the worst for COVID-19 on the second wave, which is largely starting here and spreading out. But do keep in mind that it looks like this is spreading, unless there's some sort of, you know, remediative wall that emerges around best practice with virus prevention, which seems unlikely in a country this large, you're going to see the virus spread out to the various coasts. So, when you think about that, you've already got Texas and California, which are not worst affected by COVID yet, and kind of having more than a million cases each. That could get worse. You've got an uncooperative presidential transition period, which could cost us two plus months during you know peak virus transmission period, both you know, because of flu season and cold weather, and the holiday season and the holiday shopping season which really does serve as intensifier upon intensifier. Political considerations, as I mentioned, could affect aid and relief to cat affected areas, which affects how insurers are able to then satisfy claimants and losses as well. You know, and then finally you've got you know, issues like you know, access issues, social distancing, hospital capacity, which affect how we handle the post cat environment as well. So we are not out of the woods on cat and COVID. Okay, I'm gonna take a deep breath at this point, have a sip of coffee, because I can use both. Steve's gonna start teeing up some questions. Nothing's out of bounds, guys, ask away. Those of you who know me know I mean it, and I'm gonna really ask you to show the folks who don't know me that yes, I want some questions and I'm willing to answer every one of them. Let's go for it, Steve. Thanks a lot, Tom. Um, that was a really great presentation. A lot of lot of ground covered there, and um, actually really interesting because the four four issues you speak of all have elements of silent risk to them. It seems to me they're all all things that can creep up. All have inputs that are really far outside, obviously the industry's control, and far outside of the industry's ability to model. Obviously, some of, some of these are political and social inputs, which are going to drive 
um, potential losses in the industry further down the line. Um, very interesting sort of hearing about um, COVID. Obviously, that's not a robustly worded or worded at all risk in the past, which has resulted in silent impacts. Um, cyber, we all know about the silent impacts um, that have happened to global property programs and could happen with a really major event. Catastrophes, you spoke about the aid and relief issue and how that can obviously add silently to recovery costs and insured losses as a result. And then SRCC is really just awash with potential silent inputs. So how does the industry get to grips with some of these types of risks? And is, is it all about wordings and hedging? And, and what is going to be available to them to help them to do that? I think it's least about that. It's funny, I kind of bristled on the inside when you mentioned silent. Um, because, you know, it's a different issue from what I'm bringing up. Are, are there silent issues involved or non-affirmative issues or unexpected coverage issues? Yes. Can you use wordings to get through some of that? Probably. Um, but it also speaks to the tendency of the industry to think, you know, oh, no, something bad happens. How do I exclude it? Like, no. <laughs> you know, I get it. But, you know, part of our job is to cover the bad things. If, if you exclude these enough, the value of the cover decreases. And then what happens? You've got insurance buyers are saying, yeah, you know what? I'm not going to pay more than 70 basis points for this cover because it doesn't get me anything. And the protection seller is saying, hey, you know what? I'll write it for 70 bips because I'm not losing anything. You know, that's no way to, to evolve an industry. You know, we need to provide relevant cover. Now, what's interesting is silent aside, a lot of these inputs aren't wordings issues. It's just understanding the risk and understanding the risk more broadly and understanding how the risk is evolving. You know, when you look at hurricanes, yeah. for example, I think we've done a lot of great stuff as an industry on modeling, on understanding climate change, client implications. Is there more work to be done? Absolutely. But you know what? We're paying attention to it. Uh, regulatory and legal issues like AOB, okay, they hit us hard in 17. We're starting to pay more attention to that. Well, well we you know, as an industry have had an eye on that, though. That's fine. But are we looking at things like relief issues? Not so much, especially as they affect uh, the industry loss. There's been a shortage of that. Now, what I think becomes important is kind of the, the reverse import of intelligence, right? And we hear about this in micro insurance and other emerging market issues all the time, kind of innovating in, in developing markets and then re-importing that back into mature. I think there's much more application for that beyond issues like micro and you know, political risk and post-disaster aid and impact on the insured loss or on the economic loss as proxy. It's a great opportunity for that. And I mean, I've been banging on all year about how we should have been doing that with the 2016 political violence in Turkey, the 2019 riots in uh, Chile, because you can draw a straight line from them to commercial programs in the U.S. in 2020. Interesting. Um, so on the let's go through each of the four, perhaps, and we've got some questions that I'm going to sort of weave into a few different points for you on each of the each of the horsemen. So on COVID, um, what are your what are your thoughts on sort of second wave, second events, aggregation? What are you hearing in the market from your contacts? Okay, so second wave, not hearing much yet because it's so new. But what I can tell you right now is there's an imbalance between the numbers we're seeing now and the numbers we saw in March, April, right? So you're hearing now that the numbers being bigger, infection rates being greater and faster. But there was a lot more fear and anxiety in March and April. The shutdowns felt more fear. And I think there are two reasons for this. One is prevalence of testing. There's more testing now, so there's a distinct possibility from what I've seen and heard that the number of cases in March and April is actually much higher than we realized. I think in three or four weeks, that's not going to matter anyway because we're heading on this kind of trajectory, right? I think the other issue, and this is more dangerous in my mind, uh, it, it's one of, it's kind of more an intellectual issue or a thought issue, right? Back then, we were scared. This was new. Nobody knew what was going on. There was no playbook to speak of. There was no experience with it. Um, anyone who lived through 1918 and is still alive today wasn't old enough back then to have any real perspective. Okay. 
now we've got six, seven, eight months of dealing with this. It doesn't feel as alien anymore. And people are tired. You know, COVID fatigue, you hear about all the time. It's a real thing. You know, screw it. I'm not going to let the virus hold me back. I'm going to go lick telephone poles or engage in whatever risky behavior. You know, it means that right now it doesn't seem as scary. When people go out and do that stupid or ill-advised stuff, you know, such as 30-person gatherings for Thanksgiving, um, four weeks later, we're going to have a lot more anxiety to deal with. Uh, there's a state health director, I believe, I think out of Mississippi, who is like, he was quoted as saying, you know, oh, yeah, if you want to go see Mama for Thanksgiving, you're going to wind up burying her for Christmas. Like, yeah, okay. You know, see, see grandma for Thanksgiving, bury her a month later. Tells you everything. It, it, it's, it's so blunt as to make me take pause. But you know what? It's a damn good way to put it because that's what's at stake. And I think that the absence of anxiety we're experiencing right now on a relative basis, it's going to come back. And it's going to come back rather significantly. Yeah, no, I, th I think your comment about the industry loss and saying that they, some of the early estimates – the lower ones seem seem accurate for that first wave, but it's it's incredibly difficult to predict what happens going forwards from here. And um, been reading this morning about long COVID and some studies that have been made about that, and obviously that has potential ramifications for longer-tailed insurance lines um, somewhere somewhere down the line from here. Um, so let's move on to cyber. Do, do you think the industry can learn from now its COVID experience to improve the cyber product? I hope so. That's what I want. I think the industry can. I think the bigger issue is whether the industry chooses to. I'm hearing more and more about line sizes being drawn down. I've heard about market exits. I've heard about aggregates being drawn down. Um, there's been a reduction in buying and a reduction in capacity over the past few months. Not alarming, but you know, for a class of business that was high growth and said to be the next property, you know, in terms of scale, let's head in the wrong direction after some big losses. That's that's worrisome. Um, the tough part is, it, in a normal year, maybe a heavy cat year even, you would look at that loss experience a little bit differently. But when you've got much bigger problems to deal with as well, you've got a $5 billion premium industry, you know, how much effort are you going to put into that for 10 or 15 years of potential when you've got serious stuff going on right now. Um, you know, if I were you know, the CEO of a major insurer, reinsurer, I don't know that I would choose now to double down on cyber. Uh, I would certainly keep learning about it. I wouldn't abandon the class of business. Um, I'd want to, you know, keep things moving and keep learning now so I could deploy to it later. Um, but when you, you've got, you know, 70% of your workforce working from home, you know, unexpectedly, <laughs> um, when you've got capital availability issues and market volatility, you, you got to choose your spots. Yeah, I, th I think you're right there. I think um, market conditions are going to lower the focus perhaps for certain people on cyber as they find there's now more profitable places to deploy their capacity that they do understand a little better as well. Um, but there's, yeah, there's still a lot of interesting stuff going on in the sort of startup area, I guess, on the cyber side, which is promising for the future. Absolutely. And I think that could fill the gap, so to speak, right? You know, it means that insurers and reinsurers are going to have to pay more for it later, right? Because you're either going to have to acquire those startups or trade through them um, rather than develop it yourself. But at the same time, they're going to keep that trajectory of innovation going, which is how it should be. Yeah, I mean, it really has always seemed like a marketplace that actually could could end up being developed by a, a lesser known company than one of the big big players in reinsurance, um, which will be interesting to see how that plays out. Over because obviously the risk is not going away and the values exposed are just rising all the time. We've got a question about um, intangibles. So, what of this significant intangible asset loss risk due to the effects of your four horsemen? So coverage, sort of gaps and market cap losses that could have cascading financial effects. What, what, does, what does the industry need to do about this? I mean, is this a product development opportunity? You know, in, intangibles always comes down to reputational risk, right? That's what everybody's talking about. And reputational risk is kind of like parametric. 
I mean, the conference industry wouldn't exist without it, but the insurance industry has found a way to, you know, <laughs> um, I, Alex Meekan on my team did a great analysis a year and a half ago of company share price movements following a major cyber event. And the results were just un- mind blowing because they invalidated just about every assumption that was out there. You know, you assume that, you know, major cyber attack, your company share price goes down, it's tragic. The only one that took a, a big dip, uh, at least at the time of the analysis, was Equifax you know, on Heartland okay. back in whatever, 2009. Um, reputational risk doesn't seem to be as bad as everyone thinks. Um, you know, you'd struggle to find more than a handful of examples where reputational risk was both significant and prolonged. They're out there. And I'm sure there's some guy you know, out there right now typing about, you know, some, you know, loss event, you know, 2003 in, you know, a uh, far flung part of the world. I'm sure there are, you know, there are a handful of real ones as well. Um, but reputational risks are worse when there's a crime element to it, which generally doesn't hit the industry quite so much. I think that down wrong. Um, so we're, we're not seeing a whole lot of evidence of reputational risk really being a new product op- development opportunity because the impact isn't that bad, which means why would the buyer buy it? You know, again, when you think of any new product idea, new trend, anything in this industry, it's like every other one, right? The first thing you got to figure out is who's the buyer. When someone on my team comes to me with an idea, my first question is who buys it and why? You know, that, that's why we haven't done a casualty index. You know, no one can answer that question for me. Who's the buyer? Who buys the product? So in that case, who's the protection buyer even? Why? Mm. Well, yeah, you know what? Doesn't work. Okay, let's move on. Let's find something that people need. And that's what's important here. Uh, reputational risk, um, you know, there are other forms of intangibles as well. But even there, I would say, you know, what's the law situation? Um, how likely is it, you know, what could cause it, who would buy it, who would pay for it? You know, you've got a, you know, a community of risk managers out there that's seeing their budgets reduced. And that's important to think about as well. There's this notion that there's risk out there. So everyone's going to go buy insurance. No, no. Risk managers have budgets. <laughs> they can't just go buy all the insurance they want, just like I can't go, you know, buy all, all the resource or tech I want. Just, they won't allow me to. Um, additionally, you know, it's got to be a real risk for them to, to go out and hedge. Yeah. If they're not going to buy, you know, you've got to figure out what they do want to buy. It's that simple. Yeah. No, it's interesting. Good. Perhaps on the, the sort of, the the unvalued intellectual property and the value built up within corporations. Um, there's certainly a concern about among risk managers about um, what they might call the adjacency of sort of perils that they can clearly buy insurance for, but they're maybe not able to buy sufficient capacity to actually cover the real value at risk to their businesses and how they cover those gaps, um, which is potentially going to be interesting going forward. It's a fair question. The first thing you've got to ask them is, you know, how much cover do they need and how much are they willing to pay for it? Mm-hmm. You know, if they need billions of dollars in protection and are willing to pay millions of dollars for it, you know, who, who wants to write that? You know, that, sure. that becomes sure. tricky. Uh, and I think COVID's been a really interesting test case for that, too, because we're finding out, you know, there, we hear about economic carnage, we hear about businesses going under and going to bankruptcy and DE buying them out. Um, but the risk manager experience across the overall corporate spectrum very widely. And, you know, I, I know some risk managers and professional services who are saying, you know, I might increase my total insurance spend by 2% to include pandemic. Because, sure. you know, we were able to work from home, we were able to move fast, or what we just didn't have the losses there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's let's turn to catastrophes quickly. Um, so we just had a year that is really, I mean, your, your own data, the number of catastrophes that you've designated at PCS this year has broken all the records, and um, frequency really is on everyone's mind. 
Um, what what does that mean in a reinsurance market where aggregate covers are becoming less readily available somewhat and more expensive? And it seems that, um, is that a response, do you think, to frequency that maybe people hadn't really noticed in time? Well, it's part of it, right? I mean, we've had frequency issues the past couple of years, though. I mean, this year is bad, right? Um, you know, 17 was no joke for frequency. I mean, that's what kind of started the trend, you know, away from ags, right? Because so many ags got blown on 17 and on 18. Um, what's also interesting is kind of second and third event covers have had uh, a tough couple of years as well. You know, let's not forget about Trammy in 2018. I mean, there's still some collateral trapped on that one through poor trigger structure. Mm. You know, 2019, XI and Hagavis. Um, there's been no shortage of second, third event, um, odd event issues down the line that are kind of reshaping the immediacy of different types of covers. And it's a wake-up call. I mean, yeah, one busy cat year like this changes your loss experience. And, you know, I remember I had a, a military history professor who used to say, you know, armies prepare for the last war they've fought, not the next one. Yeah. And as an industry, we do that as well. It's, I mean, it's human nature. I'm, I'm not criticizing anybody for it. Um, but the reality is, yeah, you know what? You know what you know. You got to figure that out. Everything else is imagination. And your imagination, you go pretty far. That's great. But again, imagination bumps into that budget issue pretty fast. And when you, you tell somebody, yeah, you know what, I, I've got to go buy some, you know, third event five, five bill retro. Um, and, you know, the CFO tells you, how often does that happen? When did that last happen? What does the model say? And you want to spend how much? <sighs> Reality can get tough sometimes. Sure. Um, and yeah, finally, let's uh, look at SRCC, um, which is also a really interesting peril for the industry. Um, somebody's pointed out in the questions that it um, seems completely unknowable and unquantifiable, particularly right now, given what's going on around the world. Um, and what, what does that actually mean for insurance coverage going forward from that sort of a peril? If we're, if we're in a world where people are going to make their voices heard increasingly, um, and there's a risk of these things turning into potential loss events. How does the industry respond to that? I think it responds by saying first that it is knowable and quantifiable. We just haven't been trying. I mean, right. you know, you, you look at you know, the breakdown we saw of losses, and we don't see the granularity that people see in their treaties, right? You know, we've picked a lot of trends out of this. Yeah, I, I could fill an entire conference on risk issues associated with large national retailers. And any of you guys want to call and talk about this, block out two hours and let's do it. If you're in Bermuda, you're buying the coffee and be drinking a lot of it. Okay. There's a lot you can understand around large risk programs. Um, there are tools and indices and data sets around SRCC that are out there and useful. But yeah, you know what? You've got to invest the cash, you've got to invest the time. You've got to invest the thinking. Um, the reason we don't have much knowledge or information around this, A, is it's infrequent. Uh, that seems to be changing, though. Um, even if the outbreaks are infrequent, the underlying risk conditions are almost permanent. So there's plenty of data generated for that. You know, and there, you know, we, we have a whole industry of climate nerds. Well, guess what? There are policy nerds out there, too, and sociologically nerds and other kinds of nerds who can feed all this great stuff in that you need to start understanding and quantifying the risk. Uh, you just have to do it. And we have it. You know, yeah. if you where put a worth of investment, hurricanes or SRCC, hurricanes makes a lot more sense. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to have to draw it to a close there, Tom. Um, really appreciate your time today. I think that was a fantastic presentation. Um, a lot of people have stuck around for us, but we're now more than 10 minutes over, and I've got another one of these in <laughs> just over 45 minutes. Um, so to everyone watching, please um, do dial in in just under an hour's time. We've got a discussion about secondary perils and climate risk with three meteorologists, which will be very interesting. Tom, thank you again. Really appreciate it. Um, hope you got something out of that, and I'm sure the audience really enjoyed your presentation.
Thanks, Steve. I appreciate it. Hey, guys, give me a call. That slide's up there for a reason. Great. Thank you. Uh, please, everyone, reach out to Tom if you want to ask him any questions at all.